started. Hello everyone and welcome to Eat Smart for Your Heart. My name is Michelle Smith. I'm a registered dietitian and a certified lifestyle coach. And I'm here on behalf of Harvard Pilgrim Health and Tufts Health Plan. You will have the opportunity today to put in any questions or comments that you may have in the chat box. And hopefully we'll have time at the end of the session to go over any of your questions. Before we get started, I would like to make one small suggestion. This is a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I would suggest whether you do it now or um, later on today or tomorrow, take a day and write down everything that you have to eat and drink. And then take a look at your intake and see where you're at with the recommendations that were made today. What you want to do is assess where you're at now and then make small, realistic, measurable, attainable changes. And then that way you will be much, much more successful at attaining your goals as far as eating smart for your heart. So let's get started. I'm sorry, I was muted. All right, let's get um, start over again. Know your numbers. So make sure that you know what your blood pressure is. An optimal blood pressure is under 120 over 80. One in three Americans are pre-hypertensive and don't know it. And it's because there aren't any signs or symptoms. So know what your blood pressure is. Know what your LDL cholesterol is. So make sure your LDL is under 100, the maximum is 130. So if you have a family history of heart disease or you have had heart disease, you want your LDL below 100. LDL is the one that builds up cholesterol in the arteries. Then your HDL, that's the healthy cholesterol. That's the one that removes plaque from the arteries. And that's the one we want a little bit higher, anywhere between 40 and 75. So for men, you want your HDL over 40 and for women over 50. And eating habits and lifestyle can actually help increase that number. Triglycerides, the goal is to keep it under 150 milligrams. Triglycerides come from consuming more carbohydrates than your body uses for energy. So make sure you know your numbers. All right, risk factors. We have uncontrollable risk factors and those that we can control. Those that we cannot control is our age, family history, effort uh, being African-American or pregnant. Family history plays 20%, a 20% role in heart disease. So if you have a father who's um, developed heart disease under the age of 50, you're at greater risk. And if your mother developed heart disease under the age of 60, again, you are at greater risk. So all the more reason to take, um, make an active effort to change your lifestyle in a positive way. Things that we can control. Now I'm not talking about weight here. Let's talk about waist circumference. This is something that's typically not measured in the physician's office. Don't be afraid to ask, but waist circumference, that um, adiposity, the visceral adiposity in the waist, it's what contributes to hypertension. It's what contributes to metabolic syndrome and heart disease. So know what your waist circumference is. For women, keep it under 35. And for men, keep it under 40. Do not go by your um, pant size. And again, you feel free to ask your um, practitioner to measure your waist circumference, very important. Medications can be controlled. They may um, alter our uh, numbers. They may um, affect our heart. So make sure that you're familiar with what you're taking and how it affects your health. Physical inactivity can contribute to heart disease. So stay active. Consuming too much salt, a high fat diet, highly processed foods, too much alcohol, smoking, stress, inadequate sleep, knowledge or attitude, keep a positive attitude. 
these things can be controlled. So you can see it's not just eating, it's the entire lifestyle. All right, so eating healthy for our heart. What are the benefits? Of course, we're talking about decreasing a risk of coronary artery disease. So it improves blood lipid level. All these foods we're gonna talk about play a positive role in your health. Okay, decrease inflammation and blood clotting, um, improves insulin sensitivity, improves sleep, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of these foods that we'll be talking about can actually increase your melatonin levels. That's what aids in our, in our sleep. Improves our mood. Again, these foods that we'll be talking about increase your serotonin levels. So if you're struggling with a little melancholy or seasonal affective disorder, eating these foods will actually improve your mood, makes you less vulnerable to stress, and it can actually decrease or eliminate medication and medical expenses. So it'll save you a lot of money in the long run, because if you end up with heart disease, it can be a very expensive diagnosis to maintain. All right, so how do we go about this? So you've probably heard of the Mediterranean lifestyle or Mediterranean diet. I like to call it more of a lifestyle. It incorporates physical activity, eating and staying engaged with family, staying social. But you can see this pyramid, they're in encouraging more whole grains, whole pro least processed foods. So whole grains, lots of fruits and vegetables, more um, healthy fats such as olives, olive oil, avocado, and lean proteins and fish. There's another lifestyle that's very beneficial as well, and that's the DASH lifestyle. It stands for the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a very visual person, and I find that these visual aids are very helpful. And we will go through all these foods and how to fit them in. But you can see that these three are, these two lifestyles are very similar where they're encouraging lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of whole grains, more whole foods, less processed. Okay, and these benefit our heart. Let's start with fruits and vegetables. I'm sure you remember your mother always encouraging you to eat your fruits and vegetables. Well, the guidelines are five to nine servings a day. The Mediterraneans, they were eating nine to 13 servings a day. How they fit them in, I don't know. But the average American is only taking in about three servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And the majority of it's coming from fruit. Why? Of course, because it's nice and sweet. All right. So the rule of thumb is five to nine servings a day. So again, like I said, take a look at where are you at? How many servings of fruits and vegetables are you eating? in a day. Uh, the goal would be about two cups of fruit minimum and three cups of raw vegetables or one and a half cups cooked. If you take a cup of raw vegetables, it cooks down to about a half a cup. So where do you, we know, what does your lifestyle look like? Are you eating enough fruits and vegetables? How can you fit them in? What do you like that's raw or frozen or steamed or roasted? Um, and make sure that you eat a variety of colors because there's so many different antioxidants, phytochemicals in there that really benefits our health, not only heart health, but cancer prevention. So they're anti-inflammatory, they're loaded with fiber. So they fill you up, they digest slower. So the whole fruit and vegetable would be much better than in a juice form because you'll get the pulp and the fiber from the whole fruit. It lowers your cholesterol. They're loaded with potassium. So this is where the DASH diet comes into play, encouraging more fruits and vegetables first because they're high in potassium. They do contain some calcium. For instance, the dark green leafies provide you with calcium which helps in lowering the blood pressure and keeping it at bay. They're very nutrient dense. And again, fruits and vegetables help with increasing your serotonin levels, their mood stabilizers. So this is one thing to ask yourself, are you eating enough? And if not, how can you increase your fruit and vegetable intake? The next essential food group is whole grains. Now I think on one of the pyramids, it said to eat seven to nine servings of whole grains a day. You really only need to consume three servings of whole grains. And then the remaining can be 
whatever you prefer. But the goal here, research shows at least three servings of whole grains a day because of the soluble fiber and the magnesium and the protein will actually help lower your risk for heart disease. So these are very high in protein grains. And you wanna aim for about 48 grams a day. So what constitutes the serving of whole grains? So a slice of whole grain bread is one serving, a half a cup of cooked oats is one serving or half a cup of cooked quinoa. So there are some people that are gluten sensitive. So what I did here was listed those whole grains that are gluten free. So you can see you can still take in adequate whole grains. Again, this helps lower your cholesterol levels. So you want to aim for three servings a day that you want to look for in order to determine if something is classified as a whole grain, excuse me, is a stamp that's posted here in the middle of the page will be on that label. And that's how you know it's a whole grain. And typically you see where it says excellent source, it'll give you the number of grams of whole grains. So we want to aim for about 48 grams of whole grains a day. And you can fit that in very easily. If you have a half a cup of oatmeal at breakfast, that will provide you with about 40 grams of whole grains. And then let's say you had a slice of Dave's multi-grain bread, which probably gives you, I think it's around 20 grams. So you can see it's very easy to fit in your whole grains for heart health. So again, take a look at your day. Do you eat at least three servings? If not, that might be one goal to work on. Beans and legumes. This is something that even myself, I'm still trying to work on. This is one of my goals, fitting in more. This um, is a great part of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Um, the Mediterraneans, they would eat beans or legumes daily. Research is showing just three times a week is sufficient. And the serving is a half a cup cooked. Um, peanuts are classified as a legume. So if you have peanut butter or nuts, around two tablespoons per day. Um, we will be talking about fats and nuts, but you still be, need to be mindful of the portions because they are very um, calorie dense. Okay. So do you eat three servings of beans or legumes a week? If not, how can you fit them in? Can you fit them in at breakfast, lunch, snack, or dinner? They're loaded with fiber, so they're really filling. They're going to, um, they'll absorb slower, so they won't spike your blood sugar. They're loaded with protein. They do contain some great nutrients such as potassium and iron and calcium. They'll help lower your cholesterol, meaning they'll remove the cholesterol just like oatmeal will because it's a soluble fiber. Any of the foods that are high in soluble fiber binds to the cholesterol that's in your body and helps eliminate it through the bowels. So you can decrease your cholesterol level with what you eat. Lowers blood pressure, reduces oxidative stress. There's um, research out there that eating beans uh, three times a week will actually help in reducing um, plaque buildup in the blood brain barrier of the brain and the heart, of course, and then improves insulin sensitivity. All right. The other thing to think about or food groups to think about is protein and dairy products. What's encouraged here is more lean protein. And the, for obvious reasons, we're trying to reduce our saturated fat intake. So chicken or turkey, try to be careful of ground lean proteins such as ground chicken or turkey. You still want to be mindful of the saturated fats because they could um, incorporate skin or the dark meat in there. And that could be higher in saturated fat. So really what it comes down to is What's the saturated fat content in the lean protein? You can find lean beef out there. The Mediterranean and DASH lifestyle, they encourage beef no more than once a week. So to determine your protein needs, you need around um, one to one and a half grams per kilogram of ideal body weight, or you can use your current body weight. That's perfectly fine. And to determine that, you would take your current weight Divide that by 2.2, that will give you your weight in kilograms. And then of course you'd multiply that by one. So for instance, if my weight divided by 2.2 came out to 70 kilograms, I would try to aim for about 70 grams of lean protein a day. And again, this can get very confusing. The other thing, if you find that you need more information on this and more support 
reach out to a dietitian. Most insurance companies will cover our services. So definitely work with a dietitian. But take a look at your 24-hour food intake. Are you consuming primarily lean proteins? And bonus, you're on track. But are you eating enough protein? Well, that's something that you could work with a dietitian on. Eggs, they can be part of this lifestyle. Try not to have more than one or two um, servings of eggs a week because they are very high in cholesterol. We do need cholesterol, but our bodies can make it as well. And one egg can have almost 250 milligrams of cholesterol in it. And our daily requirement of cholesterol is 300 milligrams. So it's not always about the cholesterol. I find in a lot of my uh, clients, it's really the saturated fats that are problematic or the highly processed foods. So the rule of thumb with saturated fat is try to keep it under four grams per serving. So when you're looking at animal protein, that's a, a good goal to look, aim for. And then choosing skim milk, dairy products, or if you're um, eating plant-based, that's perfectly fine. Uh, be careful with plant-based products. They can be high in sodium. So if we're pre-hypertensive or at risk for hypertension, you wanna keep your sodium under 200 milligrams per serving. Aim for about three servings a day of dairy products. As we mature, we're starting to um, lose bone density and our bodies really depend on a great foundation for healthy bones, especially once we um, reach 50 and older. So for instance, if, you're, if you enjoy cheese, you know, again, cheese in moderation, try to choose more part skim cheese, like a mozzarella, just an ounce, which is about a one inch by one inch cube, or choose skim milk or plant-based milks. Look for plant-based milks that contain protein. A lot of them don't, believe it or not, like almond milk does not have protein in it. Uh, rice milk does not have protein in it. I don't believe oat milk does either, but look at the label. Uh, if, if you're having Greek yogurt, just watch the added sugars, try to aim for less than 15 grams of added sugar and something that's low in saturated fat. The dairy products, the purpose of consuming them is to um, consume calcium and B12 and vitamin D. So if you're choosing plant-based products, make sure that there's at least 10% or greater of calcium, B12, and vitamin D. These are common nutrients that they kind of fall short on. All right, and fat facts. Yes, we do need fat, but again, we don't need a lot of fat. And research is showing that plant-based eating less processed foods is much more beneficial for those of us who are trying to prevent heart disease and diabetes. So yes, we can incorporate fats into our diet, but try not to have more than two tablespoons per day. Think about when you're at in a social event or when you go out to eat and you know, pay attention to how the mouthfeel of the food. Is it greasy? Does it, um, or watch people cook with oil. They use it like it's, okay, this is healthy. I can put it on my salad. I can cook my meat in it. I can add it to my pasta. That can be too much, okay? So try not to consume more than two tablespoons per day of the healthier oils. The healthier oils would be things like monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil, certain nuts like almonds, uh, walnuts, peanut butter, avocados, olives. Those monounsaturated fats actually decrease the LDL, the cholesterol that builds up plaque in the arteries. Then the omega-3 fatty acids are another fat that you want to try to incorporate into your lifestyle. So fish like salmon, tuna, bass, mackerel. If you don't like fish, you can certainly incorporate omega-3 fatty acids in through plants such as flax seeds or walnuts, soy or chia seeds. The omega-3 fatty acids actually increase your HDLs. So those are the ones that remove the plaque from the arteries. And then you're the, I don't like to use the word bad, but it, again, try to remove yourself from calling foods good and bad, but saturated fats, be mindful. You know, again, you know, try to set a, a limit, no more than four grams per serving. Saturated fats are found in animal products, but they're also found in highly processed foods like baked goods and cakes and pastries and chips. So be aware of that. Those can increase your LDL levels. Fish and fish oil supplements. Aim for about two servings 
two four ounce servings of fatty fish a week. So for instance, if one day you had haddock and another day you had salmon. All right. Um, the reason being, again, you have to be mindful about the amount of mercury that could be in your fish. If you're concerned about your fish and where it came from and mercury levels, there's a great site out there called Safe Seafood Watch, and that will give you a slew of information about the fish that you're choosing and where it's coming, where it's coming from, whether you want wild or farm um, fresh and mercury levels and so forth and so on. Again, if you don't like fish and you're looking to take a supplement because the plant-based um, omega-3s don't contain EPA and DHA, and that is very important for brain health is the EPA and DHA. These reduce oxidative stress, not only for the heart, but the brain as well. So some people may choose to take a supplement my favorite or my recommendation would be Nordic Naturals. Make sure this supplement is USP certified. Supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so you don't always know what you're getting, but USP certified means that it was um, monitored by a third party. So if you have a risk of heart disease, you want to aim for about a thousand milligrams of fish oil. I wouldn't suggest taking a thousand at once, maybe doing 500 after a meal in the morning and 500 in the evening. Um, if you don't have heart disease, you would take the, the same amount, but you would only do it twice a week. You don't need to take it daily. And then if you have elevated triglycerides, because research is showing taking a supplement of omega-3 fish oil actually lowers the triglyceride levels. So you would take 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams daily. And again, if you had questions about this, I highly recommend maybe talking to your physician or a, a pharmacist about a supplement. Okay, so the nutrition label can come in handy when you're shopping and you need to set limits or you need to be mindful about, because now we about the saturated fat, and the fiber, because now we know we want to keep the saturated fat at bay. We want to increase our fiber and we want to decrease and keep our sugar content low because sugar and fat can cause inflammation. We also want to be mindful of our sodium if we are prehypertensive or have hypertension because sodium can actually exacerbate it. It does not cause hypertension, but it can exacerbate your blood pressure. All right. So when you look at a nutrition label, always look at the serving size. This is macaroni and cheese and a serving is a cup. And in this cup of macaroni and cheese, you can see it has three grams of saturated fat. So, okay, that follows that rule. It's under four that fits. Well, I have high blood pressure, let's say the sodium is 470 milligrams. Rule of thumb, keep the sodium under 200 milligrams if you're pre-hypertensive or have hypertension. So this is 470, you know, well, could you still eat it? Maybe you could have half a cup instead of a cup. It still fits, okay? Just don't eat as much. Does it have any fiber? No. So when it doesn't have fiber, it tells you it's going to digest quickly if it's a carbohydrate and it may spike your blood sugar. So again, dietary fiber, we wanna aim for something that's about three grams or more. And then the sugars, you wanna look for added sugars. They're posted on, on the new labels now. A teaspoon of sugar is four grams of sugar. So this says it has five grams of, let's just say it's added sugar. That means there's a, at least a teaspoon of added sugar. How much is too much sugar? Well, anything that's 15 grams or more, because it's going to have almost four teaspoons of added sugar. Okay. So you want to be mindful about the added sugars. So those are the key nutrients that you would look for. If you're interested in potassium or so forth and so on, that's down below under the micronutrients where it says vitamin A and C. Anything 10% or more. So for instance, you can see calcium, it says it's 20%. 10% or more is a good source. All right. So again, keep it simple. Does your plate look like this? Take a look at your 24-hour food intake that you uh, maintained at lunch and dinner. Are you having at least a half a cup to a cup of fruit? Are you having about a cup of skim milk? Is half your plate filled with colorful vegetables? Do you have a half a cup of whole grain or a starchy vegetable? 
One thing we didn't mention was things like sweet potatoes and squash and white potatoes. Those are what we call starchy vegetables. And they too are very nutrient dense and contain lots of fiber. And then lean protein. Does your plate look like this at lunch and dinner? Guess what? We can all eat this at breakfast, lunch, and dinner and maintain a healthy weight. So to me, this is a very good visual to keep on hand. Okay, so we can't leave out physical activity. I mean, eating alone is, it will help with maintaining a healthy heart or preventing heart disease, but it works in a synergy with activity and stress and sleep. So keep that in mind. So here's the guidelines for physical activity. Rule of thumb is about 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, vigorous, intense is something where you can barely have a conversation. That's 20 minutes a day, three times a week. And then make sure you fit in that strength training at least twice a week, because that's good for bone health. And it keeps you strong other lifestyle changes to think about in, in regards to heart health. If you smoke, join a, um, a, um, a support group and try to quit. If you have diabetes or if you're pre-diabetic, try to prevent it or manage it. There's a great program out there called Diabetes Prevention Program. It's supported by the CDC and most insurance companies are covering it. If you think you're pre-diabetic, definitely reach out. Some of the YMCA's are providing it, some of the hospitals and some of the healthcare um, companies are providing that program and it's free, it should be free. Remember, maintain a healthy waist circumference. Men keep your waist under 40 inches and women keep it under 35. And you would measure that again, basically you would use a pliable tape measure and measure just below your belly button to see what your waist circumference is. Reduce sit time. This too is very important. If you're not into exercising, if you're not into the gym, do what you enjoy. Again, everybody's different. Take a look at your sit time one day and see if you can reduce it. Manage stress. What are you doing to manage stress? And are you getting enough sleep? At least seven and a half hours a night consistently. Okay, so that is the end of our program. These are some really great resources. Feel free to take a picture of these. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the DASH diet, you can go on, it's NHLBI, it stands for National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, and they have a free program and it walks you through the DASH lifestyle and gives you meal plans and recipes action plans. This is my favorite book on the bottom right called the Dash Diet Action Plan. It has recipes and steps to move towards heart healthy eating and lowering your blood pressure. So let's see what we have for questions. I see there's a lot of great questions here. We'll go over these. All right. The lectins and beans. Great question. I hear this all the time. Okay. Once you cook your food, because years ago, I don't remember about the raw food diet, you eat those raw foods. Yeah. You're going to take in a lot of lectins that can be damaging to your blood, but you're cooking them. So as long as you cook them, you're killing the lectins just to put it in a layman's term. So don't worry about the lectins. Once you cook them, they're easier to digest. How much, how many ounces of salmon could you have per week? So again, with the salmon, any kind of fatty fish, aim for four ounces twice a week. So that'd be eight ounces at the most per week is what you'd want to aim for, which was research is showing is very beneficial. Peanuts and peanut butter are frequently contaminated with aflatoxins. Yes, so great question. So I'm a member of Consumer Labs org highly recommended there is a fee but if you want to know more than what the fda is giving us then go on that site and it will tell you what uh, foods are safe and free of aflatoxins i don't know which ones are and it's aflatoxins basically come if the nuts get wet or moist and so it's a mold so i don't know what products have been known and i I, I'm assuming consumer labs could help you with that. That's a great question. 
Uh, when you say half a cup of say oatmeal, does that mean cooked? Great question. So oatmeal, it's a half a cup cooked. So be a quarter cup dry, will give you a half a cup cooked. So whole milk, is it off limits? That's a great question too. You have to look at the whole picture. So with saturated fats, if we say keep your saturated fats under 10 grams per day, and your whole milk might have, I don't know off the top of my head, it's a label I haven't read in a while, but let's say it has four grams of saturated fat. Well, if it fits into your whole day, then that's perfectly fine. Again, everybody's different. And you don't want to label food as bad, but if you prefer whole milk over skim and that's your only saturated fat for the day, don't sweat it. Um, are blood tests the only way to measure LDL triglycerides or is there a way to check these levels from home? I believe there is a Coles tech that you can check now, but you need to talk to your physician about that. Um, I haven't purchased one or used one, but that's something that you could talk to your practitioner about. Um, I thought 1% was usually better than skin because of the amount of vitamins. So the vitamins are not, the nutrients are not depleted in the milk. It's basically the fat. So they still have the same amount of potassium and phosphorus and calcium. So it, it, don't get too confused with that. You're not eliminating the vitamins. Um, you know, the 1% the or the whole milk. So here's the scoop. Vitamin D is better absorbed with fat. So if there's vitamin D in your milk and you're drinking skim milk, you're not going to absorb it as well as if you had it with something that contains fat. So let's say you drank 1% milk that has vitamin D, you'll absorb that. It's more readily absorbable because vitamin D needs fat for absorption. So if you want to do 1% versus skim, that's fine too. Again, look at the whole picture. Um, are there any vegan supplements for fish oil or DHA? Any recommendations? That is a great question. And you know, I do not know because they'd have to add the DHA and the EPA, EPA in it. And again, you could probably go on consumer labs or you could go on, um, there's a site supplements, certified supplements.org, I believe it is. And they may have some recommendations because what would be missing in the vegan would be the DHA and EPA, which is predominantly found in fish, so they would have, have to uh, add that in. Great questions. Thank you all for attending, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.